Welcome to Ear Biscuits. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at the Round Table of Dim Lighting, it's part four of, I think what we're calling four total episodes in our Lost Years slash Spiritual Journey series. Well, I, hope it's, I hope we're calling it four parts if it is part it, four. Well, there may be other parts. I mean. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we, we're that's continuing what I was the getting conversation. At. So in, in part one and two, uh, we discuss what happened externally between college and becoming YouTubers. Um, and then in parts three, you, you, you discuss what happened more internally with you in terms of your spiritual deconstruction. And here we are at part four, it's my turn to spill my guts. Uh, and I've, I'm gonna spew my guts all over these notes I've taken because yeah, just like you, I, I, I really, I wanted to, this is a great exercise for me to organize my thoughts. I think as I share, I think there'll be elements of it that I'm still, it'll be kind of obvious that I'm still processing. So I think it's, it's been a very, it's been very good for me to, to prep for this episode. Um, I feel emotional, I, I think just in general and also nervous to share. Um, well, you know, uh, I, before you get into it, I will say that, you know, having having shared first, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the thing I told Jesse when I got home is like, I was like, man, I just feel like this giant weight has been lifted off of me. You know, like is it because it's it's because we talked about it, or well, just because it, there was well, it's just I feel like there's this story that I've had that is 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 so personal, and you kind of carry it around, and you know how much it has mm -hmm. impacted who you are, yeah. But you know how kind of touchy it is to talk about it, right? And to just get it out there, like I I started realizing how much emotion I had kind of attached to it, but it was actually more kind of after I had done it that it sort of like kind of released. A, a little bit. Did you weep in the shower? Um, I don't remember weeping. Um, but no, it's it just yeah. I what I'm getting but at you did is take a shower. It, it's it's it is super emotional. And I will say also that you know a bunch of you are already kind of using hashtag ear biscuits on yeah. Twitter is probably the best place. That's where you know. Yeah, thanks for sharing your responses. That's the easiest way to kind of find what people are thinking and how pe people are processing. We've been reading some people's stories and a lot of people have clarifying questions. And Yeah, I if think, you got follow-up questions for us, hashtag your yeah, so if, if you that, just wanna share your experience or your well, response. If, if something comes up in the middle of Link's story, it's like pause it, write that question down. We, we want your questions. We're not trying to like close the book on this process. We don't know how Often we're going to revisit this subject, but it now is a part of what we're doing on Ear Biscuits. So we want this to be an ongoing discussion. We are still in process. Yeah, uh, and we want you to be a part of that. So, and also I, I want to thank you for sharing these episodes, this particular series, with people that you think it will resonate with, or it becomes grounds for conversations um, with friends or former friends or whatever your situation is. Thanks for sharing what we're doing here with with people, so that, that means a lot to us too. All right, um, let me get into it. I I think I'm, I was trying to figure out why I was so nervous and you know, Christy really helped me process this and I think it's that I, d I don't wanna disappoint people. I, for some reason, I mean, not only dedicated mythical beasts who may find out that my beliefs don't align with theirs, um, but also my friends, both past and present, and my extended family. I mean, this this is not something that I've, there's been an occasion for me to discuss this with them, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I just, because I just didn't want, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna disappoint them, you know? So, it, it, one thing I wanna say, I don't intend to, and I hope that no one listening feels implicated in my story. Um, I'm grateful for the path that I've taken, for the pain and the joy and the mistakes and the thrills associated with it because I don't think there was any other way for me to get to here. Um, and I know that I'm extremely fortunate um, because I know that there's so many people who've had deeply traumatic experiences associated with um, their own spiritual journeys. Um, so, I, I'm grateful 
I'm still in process and this is my story up to this point and um, I am gonna go back. I, I, I wanna start by telling a couple of stories just to give you snapshots of, just to help you feel what it was like to be me growing up in an evangelical Christian environment. So um, I'll just go ahead and get into the first story. In 1988, I was 10 years old and Bowie's Creek First Baptist Church, the church that I'd gone to my entire life. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have any memories of not going to this church. It's also the church that you started going to and with your family when you when you moved here in first grade. Um, they were holding a revival, mm-hmm. uh, which is a series of nights where you get together and uh, there's speakers and it, it gets real. Um, didn't happen all the time, but it did happen this year and it was called Contact 88. Uh, and the t-shirt. Oh yeah, it was red with like a, an, a, a cool 80s font. Contact 88, it seemed more like it was about like extraterrestrials getting to know us. Right. But it was really about making contact with God, I think. And an Irish guy. <laughs> was he not Scottish or was he Irish? Uh, well, I as you know, was... I, I'm, I'm trying to blur the lines between those two things these days. <laughs> So. In my memory, the dude is Scottish. Okay, Scottish. So this preacher that came in from out of town, I guess way out of town, um, was preaching at least on this last night, like the culmination night. This is the big one. Uh, people gonna make decisions this night. Um, he's, he gives a sermon and he explains that every person who's born into this world is born in a sinful state. Um, even, it, before you've done anything wrong, you have a compulsion to do things wrong. You have this selfishness. You're in sin, put that in quotes. And God, who created you, is being perfectly just, just cannot abide by this, these shortcomings that we have baked into who we are as humans. Um, so that's gotta be punished. You gotta, and and the punishment is not just, it's not a minor punishment here because it's, it's if you're anything short of God's standard of perfection, well that, that shortcoming needs to be paid for. It, it, somebody, it's gotta be taken out on somebody. So that's when it came to this concept of eternal separation from God and I'm, I'm pretty sure there was a mention of like eternal torment in in some fiery hell, right? Um, so as a 10 year old, just imagine 10 year old Link. I was still sleeping with a pound puppy, mm-hmm. you know? And this was, this was a big deal. It, this was something that was talked about in our church, but it was different in revival. You were really listening and so I was like, this is a big deal. I mean, eternal damnation, that's scary. And especially if it's coming from a guy who came all the way from Scotland or Ireland to tell me about it. I do think he was rolling his R's, which I think is a Scottish thing. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, in, it was enrapturing. Yeah. But it scared the shit out of him. I just love his accent. How could it not scare you, you know? Um, But then he explained that God is not only perfectly just, he's also perfectly loving. And he wants to make another way for us to have a relationship with him and not be eternally separated or currently separated from God. And it turns out God's solution is that he sent his son to come to earth, earth, Jesus, live a perfect life, never deserve an ounce of punishment or God's wrath or hell or damnation, but then willingly take it on himself anyway. And he was executed, hung on a cross, crucified, died, and paid the penalty instead of us as individuals paying the penalty. And then he rose from the dead. He resurrected and now he's seated at the right hand of God and he's listening to this sermon right now, you know, so. And he also is God. And he also is God. 
that's an important part of that too. And that happened, that happened some 1988 years ago at the time. And well, all you, yeah, give or take. Give or take 33. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so you got, so then he, Scottish dude explained, all you gotta do is accept the fact that he took the punishment that you deserved. And you also have to get up out of your pew and you gotta walk down here in front of everybody, by the way. But man, I was so scared and I was like, I knew other people, I knew you had already done this. Well, can I just say, I remember being at Contact 88 and I remember, I remember seeing you skid up. And uh -huh. you know what I was thinking? I was like, it's about damn time. <laughs> I, I mean, I was like, I did this when I was six. Yeah. I was like, you're, what? I mean, what? Why is he taking well, so you're, long? You know, you're, you you thought you were a little Scottish. Does he not understand the gospel? Like, I, yeah. like you don't have to be double digits. Were you waiting to be double digits? Because I was like, I don't know what the age of accountability is, but all For, I know is I don't want to die and go I to hell. I was a bit of a late bloomer, and I thought it. Uh, I think that was my age of accountability. Yeah, I think everybody's age of accountability is different, especially if you're still sleeping with a pound puppy. It's like a free pass. I, yeah, I went. I remember. I by the way, we're using a lot of Christianese. Yeah, the age of accountability is the age at which, if you aren't a Christian and you die, you won't go to hell because or just before that you yeah because you had don't you don't you're not you old enough to process. You can't it make yet. the decision for yourself, and it's nowhere in the Bible. It's just something you kind of have to come up with theologically because if you don't have it, it's it's pretty bad. Well, the, the kids going to hell. I understood it that day, right? And so I got up the gumption and I went forward, and I remember that. They, they paired you off with people, people and I got to be led in a prayer by Amy Moore. Ooh, this girl, you nice. know, I was 10, this girl was like in high school. It was amazing. Yeah. And she said, repeat after me, and I, I accepted what Jesus did for me. And from and at that point, I'm like, Jesus rose from the dead, he saved my life. I'm glad I don't have to worry about that hell thing anymore. And I owe this guy everything. This preacher or Jesus? Jesus. Okay. And I really like Scottish people. <laughs> now. <laughs> that might be though, Irish. But, but I don't wanna talk to them because they are scary. Um, and I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm doing, this, this, is, this is my life now. I got it, I got it all set, set up. Mm -hmm. And I'm singing in the choir next week. I sing in the choir with a bunch of adults the next, on the following Sunday, still wearing our Contact 88 t-shirts. I was beaming. Mm -hmm. um, I was a little bit jealous. I was like, maybe I should have waited so I could sing in the choir. I wanna fast forward to high school and tell a, a second snapshot that was just very formative. You wanna tell that story before or after a break? Let's, let's tell it after a quick break. Oh, let's have a quick break. Um, go to mythical.com and get this sweatshirt. Also, get this Ear Biscuits mug. We've been told. We're not making any more. Limited supplies, there's down to less than 100 of these mugs. And we're not doing it again. I mean, this is it. This is the Ear Biscuits mug, at least in this current form. Uh, so if you want one of these and you don't wanna complain about it after it's gone, you've gotta go to mythical.com and get it. So in high school, um, everything, we were still very involved in church and in youth group. I mean, if I had to rank the things that I associated my identity with, yeah, I was I was a soccer player in high school and <laughs> I was pretty amazing at it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what else I would say besides that, uh, but that would be number three. Math Olympia. Math Olympia. But number one would definitely be that I was a Christian. You know, everybody knew that, that like, we were really involved in our youth group. Our, we, we had friends who weren't involved, but like our closest friends were, and we, you know, we were, we were truly devoted to God as as high schoolers. We clowned around, but we were we were devoted, mm -hmm. um, and we understood it not just as a belief system, but as a relationship with God. Like you said last week, that was something that we were actively pursuing, talking to God through prayer in a conversational way. Um, really figuring out how the Bible applied to our everyday lives. And it, it, we tended to, you know, you'd boil it down to some, some, some oversimplified things or at least in action, like we didn't cuss, 
not in public at least, right? Uh, we didn't fool around with our girlfriends or we felt guilty about it when we did at least. That's, that's more, yeah, that's clear. And we definitely did not drink. Oh, that was, a, that was an easy one. That was an easy one, I mean, that was Ill, it was illegal. Yeah. Um, that would that that would be extreme. Um, I did listen to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but I felt bad about it, and I was called out on it by some of our our friends in the youth group. But um, one Saturday night, uh, our friend Trent, who was not involved in our youth group, I'll just <laughs> I'll just put it that way, uh, his parents were out of town that weekend, so he threw a party on a particular Saturday night. You know what story I'm going to tell? Uh huh. Um, I remember this night. So he threw this party and I decided to go. I was um, 16, I was able to drive myself and I told my mom I'm spending the night at Trent's house. She was fine with that. Um, you did not go to this party at all. That's I wasn't there for any and then left? You, you may have been there earlier but my recollection is that you were not there at all but you could have left early. That's my um, recollection but we know how recollection goes around here. Um. I definitely know what happened after you left if you were there. And that's, they broke into Trent's parents' liquor cabinet. Or the, I think they just opened it. Right. And started drinking yeah, stuff out of it. It wasn't chained. Um, Trent's older brother was there. That seemed to make me a little more comfortable. But I wasn't, I wasn't gonna drink because that wasn't me. I mean, we were, we, you know, I had to preserve my witness is what you call it. When it's like you're, your reputation as someone who's like, God is God is enough for me so I don't have to search for other ways to be happy. It was like this message that you were trying to send, I think, to your fr to, to our friends, that's what we wanted to do. But after a while, I just, I was like, you know what, screw it, I just wanna have a little fun, I'm gonna drink for the first time ever. And I did, a lot. Um, and a, a, the majority of everybody there was, was drinking and and I got drunk. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything sp specific that I regret, besides maybe the decision to break the law. And it was, you know, lie to my mom. And but my, I, I was just. You probably did some annoying things. I was. I, I'm sure I did a lot of annoying things. Right. I was very <laughs> silly, and then I didn't feel too great. And it, so I remember when when the party had died down and everybody was like, everybody. It, was crashing wherever they were gonna crash. I crashed in this guest room with our friend Jason. So we're like, you know, tr trying to go to sleep. And I just remember staring at the ceiling and feeling so guilty. And I said out loud to him, I was like, man, this guy, I'm supposed to be an example to him as what it means to have a relationship with God. And I'm like, I just want, I just feel so bad. What I did, that, that's not me, man. This isn't me. This is, I just remember saying, this isn't me. I'm just really sorry I did this. And he was like, hey man, just just go to sleep. You'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, just go to sleep. Next morning we woke up and uh, Jason was in there scrambling eggs for everybody. It was just a new day. It was like nothing had happened. But for me, it was like my life had changed. I, I, I just, like it was that big of a mistake mm -hmm. in my mind and um, Jason said, you should suck on some pennies. <laughs> and I was like, what? Uh, he said, when you go home. He had all the secrets, man. On the way home, you need to suck on some pennies so your mom doesn't smell liquor on your breath. She just smells money. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to get home, cause I was, had to go to, ch go to church. Yeah. And um, you know, my head was pounding, had a hangover, felt horrible. Um, and I opened my ashtray when I got in the, the truck to drive off and I, that's where I kept all my loose change mm -hmm. and I got a handful of pennies and threw them in my mouth and sucked on pennies all the way home. I felt so bad when I got home, I told mom, I, I just can't, I don't feel good, I, 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 can't, I can't go to church today. And she's like, okay, fine, and then, but we did have to go to Nanny's for lunch because you don't miss Nanny's for lunch. Right. And I, I could not get off the couch. I felt so bad. So I'm laying on the couch and after lunch, they're, and we're all sitting in there hanging out and I'm just laid out and I remember my mom looking at me and just saying, Link, you look, you look like you've, you're hung over. 
And I was just like, I just, I well, think it was something I ate. What does that mean? I think it was pennies, I ate pennies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just sucked on them. I didn't swallow them. That was all she said and I, we never, my mom and I have never talked about it uh, since then. Uh -oh. It's not one of those things that comes She's up. gonna listen to this? Sorry, mom. Um, but that afternoon, you came by and we got in your car and we were hanging out and we did what we would always do when we were 16, 17 years old, is that we would just drive around and talk and listen to music. Right. I remember we were doing that this day and I knew that you were gonna find out that I had gotten drunk the night before. I mean, if I didn't tell you, somebody else is gonna tell you. And that, I just, it would be better for you to find out from me. Whew, that was tough. I remember we were driving and I, I told you at Trent's party last night, I, I got drunk. And you looked at me and you slowed, this, slowed the car down and then you pulled over on the side of the two lane country road that we were driving down beside a field. And I looked at you and you looked at me and you said, get out. <laughs> oh, wow. And I, I said, what, what? He said, get out, man. And I opened the door, I got out and Picture an extremely wide cinematic shot of a guy standing on the side of the road beside a car in the middle of nowhere, Harnett County, just fields and a few farmhouses in every direction you look. And you drove off. Yep. Um, and I just stood there and I knew how to get home because we had driven all these roads, but it was but at were, least six miles you away. Good, you were a good ways out. It was at least six miles, maybe eight from my house. I started walking because you just you didn't stop. I mean, you went straight down that long straightaway and then you disappeared over the horizon. And I just started walking home. And I started thinking about the decision I had made and it was like the biggest decision. I guess I would have described it at the time as an act of rebellion. I don't know if that's what it was, but it was, it was a big mistake in my mind. And I just started crying, like weeping, like tears, just just flowing off my face and just walking on in the grass on the side of this road and uh i you know i remember that I, it was it's hard to see where i was going <laughs> you know if i was going to step in something and i remember looking up how far do i have to go to even clear this hill and then i saw you coming back over the hill. First I saw your head, then I saw your shoulders, and then you, you cleared the hill and you were walking. You weren't in your car, you were walking on the side of the road. And it was kind of awkward because it's a long ways to walk. So okay, I get it, you're walking. But we finally did we met, you know, we were walking towards each other and uh, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I know it was basically, I'm so sorry for what I did. And I, it, it wasn't that I had, I wasn't sorry that I disappointed you, it was that I was so sorry that I disappointed God. And 
I mean, I don't think we, I don't think there was a hug. I don't think there was a handshake. I think that our MO at the time was like just, we knew what we both felt and what we thought and about what had happened. And um, I, uh, you know, I interpret it as a, as a, a, like a physical representation of not only the fact that you loved me as a friend, but that God forgave me. That, you know, I think it was, I we tended to think a lot in terms of symbolism, you know, and I, so I don't know how much of that was going through your mind, but I think that it really hit home for me. I just felt like this is a big deal. There was a lot of disappointment here, but I'm not, you know, I'm not, God hasn't rejected me. I'm already, I'm already forgiven. Um, and we walked back to the car, we got in and we we drove off. And yeah, it was just a picture of forgiveness and I think it was really powerful. And I mean, the thing is we were, we were devoted to God and we were devoted to helping each other stay devoted. You know, the, it was so important to us and um, we were steeped. We were steeped in the teachings that our church and our family gave us, and the experiences we had within the church. Um, so then, when we went to college and got involved in Campus Crusade for Christ, all of a sudden, everyone in that group was also devoted to God in the same way. Everybody wanted the same thing. It was. It, it was actually. It was exciting because it was so much easier for me to be who I'd lived my entire life aspiring to be, somebody completely sold out for Jesus. You know, I think we, we in episode one we painted this opportunistic approach to like our involvement in Campus Crusade that like really served our career. And I just, you know, there was absolutely, and I do think we, we talked about it, there was a parallel path of like s spiritually and personally this is this is what this is how we wanted to live our lives. This was this is a perfect scenario for that, you know? It was it was Yeah, we weren't there. We weren't there first and foremost to try to become comedians or have an audience because we didn't even know we didn't even know that was an option. It was like this is what we want. These are the these are the people that we want to be around. So the, the so the things that we weren't doing and the things that we were doing may seem a little odd. Like I mean there wasn't any partying ever in like the traditional tropish collegiate sense. Um, there was a lot of group dates going on. You oh, know, yeah. if you were interested in somebody, there was like the the way to be as, as pure as possible about a, approaching dating. I was really good at organizing those. I could, I could have a, a men's Bible study, take a women's Bible study out for a, just a night on the town. And it, you know, as long as you're in a group, it's like you, you can stay, can, nothing you can stay can out of trouble. Christy and I never kissed until we were engaged to be married. You know, it was, and that was, that was my decision. That's not something that anybody f forced on me. You know, it, that wasn't the action, like the specific teaching of anybody, but it was Because like, I, I did not subscribe to that particular. <laughs> you know, I had. Interpretation. <laughs> I had come off of a relationship in my senior year of high school, freshman year of college that I felt like I had made mistakes in not being self-controlled and um, I was eat up with guilt associated with that. And mm -hmm. I just did not wanna screw up my relationship with Christy and, and cause I saw that it has so much potential. And I, I wanted to please God, you know, and I wanted to do it right. You know how I think. There's a there's a best way to do everything. There's a there's a perfect execution of 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 everything. And I'm going to try to it's safest if I stay within that, you know, especially when it, it comes to disappointing God or not. Um so so yeah, we were, it may seem odd to you listening. You were a, gr a great handholder, I'm assuming. That was I you know, like I was so calculated. I was like, I'm only gonna go out on a date with her once a month and we're only gonna talk once a week and I want her to you know, I want her to I don't wanna get in the way of her being devoted to God and I want God I wanna be devoted to God and her second and um you know, I I felt for the old me reading back through my journals, but 
and I'll read one in a second, but I just wanna, I, I wanna say that, yeah, I was, I was extreme because of just the way I interacted with the environment and the teaching. Um, but it was thrilling to be, like, like, like we said before, be, it was thrilling to answer a higher calling, to connect with God, and to go through it with really great friends. It was the most meaning and satisfaction I'd ever experienced in my life, mm -hmm. you know, within that context. But in, as I prepped for this, I did go back and I re read through my journals, and whenever I would journal, um, it was always in the form of prayer. It, I was writing a letter to God because it was hard for me to pray. But if I wrote it down, at least I could concentrate and I could get my thoughts out and it was at least my side of the conversation with God. I mean, you did that too some, right? Yeah. Um, but I wanna read an excerpt from this one journal entry from, this is my junior year, so on January 20th, 1999, okay? So uh, this is what I wrote, Lord, I'm frustrated about us. I just feel guilty that it's not clicking, like I'm just bad or wrong or lazy or something. I'm tired of feeling pressure and guilt to spend time with you. Lord, I would quit trying altogether if I didn't know how stupid and mindless that would be. To whom shall I go? Which was like my paraphrase of a, uh, a Bible verse meaning where would I turn if I, if I turned away from God? Um, and it wasn't just that journal entry, like the, the vast majority of my journal entries uh, over those years, it was, it was actually heartbreaking. Uh, they, were, they were filled, and I'm talking like 80% of mm. anything I would write, it was filled with me apologizing for disappointing God. Um, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of frustration for not being devoted enough. And I, I, didn't, I didn't really appreciate I, or recall that internal struggle that I was having. I'd kind, of, I'd kind of forgotten that until I went back and started reading through the journals and I was a little bit shocked. Hmm. It's not that I journaled all the time and I, I do think there's a factor of I would journal when I felt like I really needed my, my my relationship with God needed a kick in the pants, like I really needed to like buckle down. And so, I, and then if maybe if things were going better, I just didn't journal. Maybe that's another explanation. But it, it was a lot of, the, a, a lot of my private experience, I think was, um, was kind of defined by that level of shame and frustration. And I, again, I, I don't, you tell me what you, I don't wanna uh, imply that the main teaching from crew or our our church, the church that we grew up in was really super legalistic. I don't, I don't think, they, they were not super legalistic. There was not a constant emphasis on following certain rules. The emphasis was on having like a personal relationship with God, but there, there are, there are factors associated with going about that relationship that the way that I internalized that was that I was failing at it, that I didn't have what like the people who it was really working for had, that I was very hard on myself. Well, I, I would say that it, we were on a spectrum. So I would say that compared to just the general Pop sure. Population, we were legalistic without a doubt. Oh, yeah. Because we did have a bunch of rules that were sort of, you know, interpretations of, of the Bible that and applied to our specific situation and right. our specific culture that kind of led to things like not kissing your, your girlfriend until you're engaged to be married. But I, but I do think that most of this is just. The way that different personalities interact with it, because yeah, yeah, for me, I was having all those intellectual thoughts and doubts, and that's a lot of the stuff that I would be like writing about and thinking about. But when it came to, and of course, I felt like, oh, I'm prideful and I'm lustful and all the, you know, the 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 the, the ways that I thought I was sinful. Mm -hmm. But I, f I think I kind of gave myself more of a break than you d did just because that's my personality. I don't think I was hard on myself that I would that I sinned. 
I was hard on myself that I didn't have a quality of relationship with God where I was motivated to connect with him, to pray, to do like the spiritual disciplines of like study the Bible and pray and the things that I felt like were a true test of intimacy with God, like our the human's role in that, I felt like I just I was I was trying to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I was I was trying to conjure something that I didn't that's that came naturally to people who had like a true connection to God. I also think you were perceiving that that was happening with people and I, and I think that everybody has their own struggle. I, I sure. Don't, I, I don't think it was right. like. But it's interesting that, and I think we had to have talked about it, but it, I kept going back to it so much in my journal that like it's just something that I couldn't shake because of, and I'm starting to understand myself now in a way that I never have, and so I can see things that I've learned about myself now in terms of like an unhealthy view of being a perfectionist um, being a one on the Enneagram, um, if you're if you're into that, um, I, I do think it was me disappoint being disappointed in myself more than people telling me that God was disappointed in me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in you know when I graduated, Christy and I got married. Th- there was another level of pressure because then. The teaching was I was to assume the role of the spiritual leader is what it was called. It's like you know, initiate prayer with your your family and like make decisions and make sure you're doing as a family what God has for you. And you know that that was that was difficult for me. Um, and then after a couple of years, we joined staff. And, and just to clarify, that was very much the, this definitely isn't necessarily the sort of the standpoint of a lot of even Christian churches at this point, but yeah. very much the sort of the branch that we were in, um, you know, you've got e- egalitarianism and you've got complementarianism. And so we were we were complementarian, meaning that there women and men have specific roles, right? And so in the household, the man, is supposed to be the spiritual leader. He's the one that kind of everything falls onto to make sure that his family is is following God. That was, you know, our interpretation of some New Testament passages. When we joined staff of crew, um, now my spiritual identity was also my professional identity. And you know, I I was fully committed to God, but also now financially completely dependent on <laughs> all these people who believed in what we, I believed in and they believed in the work that we were doing when we raised financial support. So I put even more pressure on myself because I had these people investing in our work and I had and I was doing I was I was a professional Christian at this point. I shouldn't I be good at it? <laughs> should I start to have a little bit of a Scottish accent? Yeah, you should. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um but I I had this nagging sense of being hollow that you know, I, I just, it was always there, I couldn't quite shake it. And around this time, that's when Rhett started talking about the age of the earth and the validity of evolution. We started talking about those things. Well, you started talking about them with me. I was, you know, I didn't have, I, I don't have doubts and I don't sit around as I'm falling asleep or in my spare time just like having, Logic battles in my mind. It's just not, you know. Uh, I I have ba- I have the battles I was having. What was I'm not, I'm not I'm not I'm not doing this good enough. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I just devoted all of my energy there. Um, but whenever you would bring something up, first of all, I knew like, well, I'm not going to panic. You know, you made the joke of like Jesse would start crying because it was perceived as such a threat, and I totally get that. It was, I was like. I, re- I remember having an internal dialogue of, okay, just don't panic, be cool about this, just be a sounding board for what Rhett wants to talk about because, you know, I'm not gonna fall for the trap of like, well, you know, you can't you can't go there because it might lead to something. It's like, I'd, so I, I mean, I started listening and, you know, when you read Francis Collins, The Language of God in 2006, I also read that and I was like, yeah, it's like, I'm convinced in the validity of 
evolution. And I remember, I remember an un, un, unintended consequence of reading that book was I just had this sense, and we discussed it, that that there was an island with God on it, and it was shrinking as science discovered more and more, and it would le- ultimately lead to a place where, whoop the the waters of science would cover the top of the island, and there would be no more God. You know, that's actually what we were taught in terms of this. Oh, it's if you start if you start looking into evolution, it's a slippery slope. That's well, what they would say, and I will say, ironically. <laughs> We're not doing Francis Collins any favors <laughs> Bet- no. between my story and your story. I hate I you know I'm not I'm not trying to give us that much credit. Like this is so many people are going to listen to this, but a lot of people like Ken Ham, you know, and get, and you know, like the head of Answers in Genesis are going to be like, I told you, and he's got an Australian accent, but he's going to say, I told you, you can't believe in evolution. Look what happened if you if you if you if you if you do it if you believe in it. And it's all Francis Collins' fault. Well, I'm I'm very grateful, but it, I think it because that wasn't his point in the book, the shrinking island thing. But it's something that we discussed, and that because we just started asking these questions of like, well, if Adam and Eve never existed, doesn't Paul say in the Bible that the whole point of Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection was to undo Adam's original sin, and then? But for, so, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't want to get, you know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm a professional Christian. I don't, you know, I'm panicking inside. So I'm like, there are answers. You can find them. You can, anything you want to believe, you can find something. Right. Cause as and I, and I started to find those well, things. Cause as I said, cause I, I was very resistant. I, I don't want to give short shrift to this, if that's the correct word. I know there are lots of Christians who accept evolution as it's taught, as it's understood by scientists. And still believe in Adam and Eve, and they have, there's a way that they reconcile that. I'm very familiar. You don't have to tweet those books at me. I'm very familiar with that argument. Uh, I just think there's some other issues going on. But so yeah, it, 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 you you can you can accept both of those things. It, and I took comfort in that because I'm I'm sitting here on staff, man. I can't. You know, it's like what am I gonna what am I gonna do? Just like become homeless. It was too much at stake. Um, so I kept the most threatening questions at bay until after we left staff. Mm-hmm. And so in t- 2008, up until 2011, I mean, that's we, we, we were starting our c- career as YouTubers and then that time frame where we were developing this new career, I was also d- developing a growing spiritual disillusionment and there were two parallel paths for me. Um, One was um, the intellectual path and then the other parallel path was the experiential, what was happening to me in my heart and my my circumstance. Um, So I'll talk about both of those. First, I mean intellectually the discussions that we had, they they continued. I think they accelerated. It was the the next thing, and again, you can kind of superimpose Rhett's talk on top of mine whenever he mentions like di- dismantling his view. It was also my view of the Old Testament. You know, the the early stuff in the Old Testament it can't be literal. You know, becoming convinced of that. And then continuing to read in the Old Testament, it's like the Old Testament God mandated a lot of actions that troubled me. I just, you know, it was like, you worship a God that, I mean, there's some, I mean, I'm not even talking about head scratchers, I'm talking about like, oh my gosh, this is frightening. Hmm. Our view of the Bible started to dismantle. We were having lots of conversations about it. I I wasn't I wasn't chomping at the bit to go home and report all of these conversations because I didn't I didn't know I thought it was a thought exercise. You know, I didn't I didn't I didn't know where it was going to lead and I didn't, you know, I didn't want to I was like, man, I I want to process this with Christy, but I don't want to scare her. Mm-hmm. So, I talked to her about you know, for every one time, every eight times we talked, I might I might talk to her about it once, just because it was, yeah, you know, a lot of other shit going on in our lives. I don't want to add that into the equation. Um, but then the experiential p- 
parallel path was ever ever since graduating from college and leaving Campus Crusade as a student, like I got, we, Chris and I got involved in a church, different church than you, um, and it was a small church, so they had an immediate need for someone to help lead the music. And because I'd done that at Campus Crusade, they asked me to do it, and I knew I could do it, but I was, I was reluctant. Uh, and increasingly more over time, but you know, it was the right thing to do. I was like, I can really, I can, this is how I can contribute at my church. Um, leading, leading the the praise and worship music. So I was like the music leader at my church up until moving to Los Angeles. But uh, th- there were a lot of places that I was. I guess I was having an internal existential crisis, you know, but. I, I, I remember it being very palpable every Sunday morning because I would get on stage and I would I would I would pray and I would lead the music and I would say some things to help contextualize the songs that we were singing so that people in the audience could like really connect with God. Yet I found it impossible virtually impossible for me to be able to connect with God in that way through music on a Sunday morning and I remember I would try harder and harder. I would like clamp my eyes shut and, and really concentrate on the words that I was singing that were moving people emotionally and spiritually out there. But for me, it it proved, it, it, it was like there was a brick wall there. I just couldn't, I, I couldn't get there. Um, and that was really frustrating. And I think there's a lot of, you know, yeah, there were there were practical aspects of that. And it's like, you know, I am a performer. You're on stage, you know people are watching, even if the goal is to not be seen and kind of step out of the way, so to speak. That's probably still a factor. And and then when I start thinking about it, it's like, I don't know, it's just, it, I remember after church every Sunday, I would tell Christy, I'm just, I'm not who they think I am. They think I'm clamping my eyes shut because I'm having such a meaningful experience, but I'm clamping my eyes shut because I can't find anything. And I would talk to a few people about it, like I would mention something and it was, you know, it was, it's just, it's a hairy kind of thing to get into. So it's, and that really started to come to a head like the the six months leading up to us moving to LA. Um, I felt, I just, I, I, I started saying things like, I just feel phony. And the conversations we were having, again in parallel were, I mean, it was the one two punch of, you know, I'm not, I'm not experiencing an intimacy with God and then I don't, I'm starting to question the foundations of everything that this is built on. So they, those two, paths fed each other for me. Well, you know, there was an, just to add a little color to this, speaking of our conversations, um, we also had another kind of conversation and we had it pretty often. Do you remember we would be sitting in that office in Lillington or even our office in Fuquay and we would be like, man, you know, I just feel like we really haven't been focusing on the Lord and like a lot of things are happening and like mm-hmm. I just feel like we need to we need to just recognize yeah how we got where we're at and and seek the Lord's guidance and like me and you would just sit there and pray together. Yeah, we would and we would have and, and the first part of the prayer was is always like Lord man, we suck. Yeah. You it's know, like you've given us so much. You're giving us our heart's desire. Like we like we we have this career. There's a lot like, of guilt. There was yeah. a lot of guilt. There was a lot of shame. But even in the, I'm just, the reason I'm adding that is because I'm just remembering in the midst of the again, as I hope I made clear. But in the midst of the doubt, there was for both of us. I know you're talking about how you were struggling with the connection, but it was still paramount. It was still central, and it was still kind of what everything was based on. And when we felt like we were sort of moving forward. And without giving God the credit, 
and without consulting him, we felt bad and we would like yeah. check in on each other and then pray. For like at least 30 minutes we would just pray. Yeah. And when you feel, I mean, like praying with somebody was such an intimate thing. It was like, it. It. the reason why we didn't do it was because it was like, yeah, it was like this intimate thing that like, it was so super vulnerable. Yeah, we were both naked. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it was like, I mean, it's like, you know, we weren't gonna, we weren't gonna cry together or something like that, but it was, again, it was so important that we were willing to do that. I mean, I, mean, I remember when I was dating Christy, like, we wouldn't pray together. Ironically, like, when you get married, it's like, now you're the spiritual leader, but we talked, we talked well, about we, how. We were told well, not to pray with Don't each other. pray together because that's, that's more intimate than like, I don't know. A well, sexual act. Well, because we heard stories about boyfriends and girlfriends praying together and then making out right after because they were so connected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that, those prayer kisses, that prayer tongue. <laughs> that, so, that speaking in tongues right there. Oh, I knew I'd find that joke. I'd find it. So I just felt, I, I felt fed up with this f phony feeling every week. And I, and, I, and I felt like it was on me but I started to question if it was, if it was worth it. And I started to think, it looks like we're gonna move to LA at least for six months. And if it doesn't happen, I don't, I'll just, I'm just gonna have to step down. I just can't, I, this is not authentic. This is not, this is not good for anybody. I didn't, I, I wasn't saying I was gonna leave the church, but I was gonna, but that would have been like maybe the next step. Um, and I meant that specific church. It wasn't, I didn't know what I believed, but it was just like, I mean, we were just having constant conversations and then we moved to LA and I was so relieved because it spared me all of these awkward and painful conversations that I felt like I was about to have to have with like my pastor who was like a really good friend and um, you know, I, again, I. Throughout all of this, I'm not trying to implicate anybody because I, I bet anybody listening, and I just think about this, like, man, I wish you would have said something. It's like, uh, I know it would have been probably a gracious response, but I know it would have been. But it's like I didn't want to, I didn't want to get into it, and so it was, and and tell my family that I wasn't, I wasn't going to church, or I wasn't, you know, I wasn't serving in the church the way that I was anymore. Like things are different, you know. So I, you just don't want to get into it. So well, Ellen, because you become a, I don't, I don't wanna keep cutting you off, but you be, when you express doubt in, in the midst of church, a lot of times people say, hey, listen, if you've got doubts, that's part of the, that's part of the experience and, 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 and talk to people about them. And, 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 and we did, we talked we, we talk to a lot of people, but it's still, the fact remains that when you raise the kinds of questions that we were having, you do become a difficult and complicated person for a church body. And a lot of times those people especially if they're not satisfied with the answers they're getting, they kind of get pushed out because I got the flock I gotta worry about. I got this little crazy sheep that's asking all these weird questions. Yeah. He's taking a lot of time. Right. So I understand logistically why that happens, but I think you were a little bit scared of becoming someone's project. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, which is very much my experience. Yeah, um, I had one friend besides you that I confided in who, who didn't go to that church anymore because he was going somewhere else. But I had some I had some resources, um, and of course Christy. But moving to L.A. was like a big relief because I could sidestep the the whole thing. And just like you said, we 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 both got involved in church out there, and I was like, well, maybe I, I bet it's different out here. And um, but we went to what's still like an evangelical church because that was our point of reference. And I was like. I'm not gonna make the mistake of like, compli like I ain't gonna be on stage or anything like that. I'm just gonna receive. Well, they had I'm, like professional musicians on yeah, stage. I, it was like, <laughs> hey, I could have made it. LA Church nah. is, is a different deal. It's like, yeah. I don't know, I'm, I mean, you're great, but you, I don't know if you would've made the cut, just to be honest. I wouldn't have made the cut. Uh, and the guy had an accent too, he's he British. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and just like you. Much cooler than you. I, w I was hopeful that it would be like a time where I just, I could remove the pressure, but I could experience, and then I could experience God. But I was very skeptical by this point because of that parallel path. I I no longer believed in the Bible as the inerrant word of God. Um, 
again, you presented a lot of these resources. It's not like, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna go through all of that. Yeah. Um, I was, I think in retrospect, I was slowly crossing the boundary from b- belief to disbelief. Just like you get, it's a very permeable place. And it's not just, for me, it wasn't just like this one thing happened, but I just started to realize one day I, I, I had, I must have overnight experienced some subtle shift that I was just ever so slightly on the other side of a boundary and I was looking at it from the other side. And my growing list of problems with the Bible and evangelicalism, all, all of a sudden like all, all of that li- th- those problems that, that per- popped up over my whole life to this point, they had much simpler explanations when I was looking at it from the outside. Mm-hmm. And again, I was like teetering, but uh, like the teaching of hell, you know, I'm, uh, I, I just wasn't, I was letting go of that. Uh, plus, the, I mean, the discrimination of the LBGTQ plus communities within the church, I mean, that had troubled me for years, and you, I know that. And all of a sudden, you're like, uh, hold on, it's like, I can, ex- I can accept everybody, <laughs> you know? I, and then we were discussing Jesus. And, as you said in your story, it was like, I think again, I don't want to get into the arguments that like started to sway us at, like to believe that like there what he he probably didn't raise from the dead, but it's it's always just this probably or it's just there's you just can't know. And I started to feel it was more likely that he didn't actually raise from the dead, and I just found myself believing that as the the cumulative um, conclusion of all the reading that I had also been doing and the conversations we've been having for years by this point. So my entire belief system was very tenuous. And I, you know, I realized, I know about myself, like you, you got the two words belief and system and I know enough about myself to know that I thought a lot about the belief but I cared a lot about the system. You know, as a as a perfectionist, I took a lot of comfort in knowing that there was, if I'm just signed up for all of this, like, I know I'm safe I, eternally. I know that as I, I just have, I trust that like if I don't know everything that I should believe or everything I should be doing, at least I will, it's all there and I'll get to it. And it was, it was, it felt very secure for me. Someone who I, I think really value that, really needed to know that I was doing it right and that I was safe. Um, but I think by this point in my life, the beliefs, the questions associated with the beliefs, I was so uncomfortable with the basis of those and the now the the practical outcome of those that it, overco- it, it overcame my interest in keeping a system. Um, I, I remember we were ta- we would hang out with some friends and we would discuss some of this stuff, what we were going through. And there was one guy who was, you know, great guy, he was Christian, who said, you know, I actually don't, I don't wanna hear what you're talking about because I don't want to lose what I have and I think you'd probably convince me. And this is working for me and my family. So I love you guys, but I just, I, I gotta bow out of this conversation, you know? And I got that, I understood it. I, I wasn't, I don't think I was hurt by that, but I couldn't, and I, because I was that way for a long time as we were talking about it, but I couldn't live like that anymore. I, I felt like I just, I had to face the, the facts or the compelling arguments that I had never been willing to look at because I need of what I needed, I was getting from my faith. Um, 
But again, all those things started to shift. You start to think about the billions of people who've, who've sought God for revelation and they've gotten nothing or they've received profound revelation that is in direct contradiction to the profound revelation that somebody else has gotten. You know, it's, I just found myself starting to believe that, just like you said, that you know, I mean, humans have a way of of trying to. We got to make sense of things, and so this is just. I just found it most reasonable to believe that the Bible represented humans trying their best to explain God, and it was one of many well developed explanations across many religions. And they were all accompanied by sincere experiences to validate them. So, church, to, to say the least, church became a place of frustration, not comfort for me. Um, why was I working so hard to make Christianity work for me if it wasn't even true? Um, and I think it's because the the alternative was so scary. I mean, it was it was all I knew. It was, you know, you, you gave the analogy of like the ship and then jumping into this water, and it's like you even look over the side of the ship and you're like, man, it's like everything I've taught is that it's it's real ugly down there. Um, but at a certain point, you kind of find that you're in midair falling into it anyway. I mean, it's, it's that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can lead. You can't make someone fall in love with you. You can't, if you find yourself falling Bonnie, out of love Bonnie with somebody. Ray, Bonnie Raitt said yeah. that. Yeah. I, I, I must have replaced the, the Bible with Bonnie Raitt. Well, I, yeah, I, I, can, I, I completely relate with and agree to everything that you're saying and I think that I thought a little bit more about that, the boat analogy and the, the, the fact is is that and I think this is one of the reasons that you know our friend was like, hey, don't rock my boat mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is because it is a boat, it, the boat's not fake, right? You know what I'm saying? It's like it is a system, it is beneficial, it has helped millions of people, it's helping millions of people right now. It has uh, stood the test of time, so have other religions. But yeah, it's it, if it because people are like, hold on, did was it if you if it wasn't real? Well, what what about your life change and your growth? Well, no, just, there was real life change. There was real growth. There was real community. There was the, all these experiences were real in a sense. We're just saying that we think that they were most likely happening in our minds and in everyone else's minds, which are incredibly powerful things. It doesn't mean that the change isn't real. Some, some people that I know when I tell them my story will be like, but listen, I know it's real because of what Jesus did in my life. Let me tell you my testimony. Yeah, so I'm not denying that your life hasn't changed. And that's what I'm saying. There's sincere yeah. experiences to validate all kinds of things. Every, every belief system. Yeah. And so I just, you know, I, I respect it, but I just can't, I, that's not compelling me this horse to drink that water well, it doesn't at make, this point. It, it, another way is it doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true. It might make it true or feel true to you but it doesn't necessarily make it universally true so, just because you had an experience. So at this point, I mean, again, we're, I, we must have been discussing this because you used the term like you conducted an experiment and I definitely remember using that term at the time. I think it, it was a way to say, "Hey, I'm just going to ease. I'm going to ease into believing differently and see what happens." It's not, you know, it can just be private. Uh, I, I wrote in my journal, November fifth, twenty thirteen. Again, this was addressed to God, but I, it's the last journal entry that I've written. <laughs> like I, I don't. Whoa, really? Yeah, well, that's not actually. That's not true. For a long time it was. Okay. This is what I meant to say. It was the last journal entry that I wrote addressed to God. Oh, okay. And this is not the beginning, this is a part in the middle. And I think I wrote this as kind of a record for myself too. You can see in the way I wrote it. It was just like, I wanna know that this was the point, this is the date, the point in my life when I got, when I, when I felt this way. And I'm glad I did, because I, I wouldn't have known it was November 5th, 2013. 
here's what I wrote. Since moving out here, and that's to LA, and combined with Rhett sharing his evolving perspective, I have slowly given up trying to be the Christian that I feel like I've been trying to be all these years. I've concluded that I'm not going to do the things I've always done, the right things, the spiritual disciplines, and expect different results, intimacy with God. Or even more directly, I'm gonna give up feeling guilty for not being better and doing better at Christianity. And this experiment has felt good, freeing for the most part. Everything except feeling like I'm letting Christy and the kids down. At this point, I'm not sure if God exists. And you, you see my mindset at that time, it was, it's, it seemed like I was just saying, I'm gonna, stop, I'm gonna stop feeling so guilty for the things I'm not doing to try to be a good Christian, but, and so it sounds like I'm like, but I'm, st- I'm just gonna be a Christian, I'm gonna let go and let God. And I do think that's what a lot of people who um, may be hearing in my, they, that's maybe how they're responding to my story, is that like, you know, we all go through those, those times and the struggles you're having, it's kind, it, that's common to every person who's like very serious about pursuing Jesus. But I, I think what was really happening was, th- yes, that was my true experience even though I sincerely sought God my entire life. Um, but it primed me to be open to dealing with what I felt were the, the intellectual things that I didn't list in this journal entry but I think that's what held the weight to make the decision. That's what eroded the foundation and it was very important to me um and like i said i it felt freeing like i didn't i didn't i was surprised that i didn't f- experience a sense of extreme loss i was afraid of what it would mean for just like you said would mean for my marriage because um i had believed that a christian and a non-christian can't stay married like do I, but I actually, I, I just couldn't live, I couldn't pretend anymore and I, and so one of the things that I called into question was if that was true. Like I never would have done it if I thought it was still true that I was gonna lead to divorce. I would have just, you put my head down and, and trudged on. But I actually believed that like our marriage could still be vibrant. I had no clue how that would work though. Um, I believed that I could still be a great father to my kids and that they would be okay. I felt like my kids would be better people. I could influence them in the best way possible by being as honest with them as possible for appropriate to their ages versus trying to give them a, what I believed was a false sense of security in teaching something much less, because I wasn't gonna give them the fear version that I had gotten. So I, I felt okay about it. Um, but I still went to church with Christy and the kids because I didn't wanna be that guy. Like I, I had judged hard, the guy who would not go to church with his family. It's like what a jackass, that's what I felt like. Yeah. I was like, so I ain't gonna be that guy. Right. But it was so, it was so difficult um, because again, it, it, was a, it was a place of frustration, not a place of comfort for me. And anything that was said, I would always try to derive what it was based on. And like, I was like, man, this is all, sh- this is all shifting sand that you're, that you're building all this on. That's how I would feel and I would get frustrated. Um, I remember on Easter Sunday, we were all sitting in the minivan and I was just like, I don't think I can go in there. And Christy was crying and we ended up taking the kids into the youth group and coming back to the minivan and just sitting there in the parking lot and just bawling our eyes out. Christy, it was, she'd been, I think it was, she was still one year after her brain injury, which again, it was like an extreme low point for her. I was saying, I don't think I can go in there. And she was saying, I don't think I cannot go in there. Um, and it, you know, I, we, it wasn't, we were grappling with our, how our beliefs were changing and it was something that we were talking about much more than when I referenced it earlier, like 
one out of every eight times we would talk. No, this was something that we were talking about a lot now. I was not keeping it from Christy or the kids. Um, but she, she was in a place, like the most difficult thing was happening in, in her brain and in her body and suffering from post-concussion syndrome, which she still suffers from many years later. It was an extreme low point for her and it was like, she 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 was wrestling with it, but she couldn't she couldn't do that. There was much more at stake for her than there was for me at that point. Um. So I I I, I would go to church with them, and then I would I would just explain the things that I have trouble with become a a so, you know a part of our conversations that we'd have as a family because I was just like you know I just want to. I want everybody to be able to start to think for themselves and not have something shoved down their throat. And I don't think anybody was doing that, so I felt okay with it in the church and in our our conversations. But I, uh, over time, I you, you know, I eventually stopped going to church, and then my family ended up stopped going. It wasn't too long after that, but you know the 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 thing that happened was I. The specific issue of the LGBTQ um, issues and how the, the the church was a welcoming place and a loving place, but then when you really got down to it, they weren't accepted as couples. There was, you know, you couldn't be married there, and that really ate away at me, and. You know, it's, I mean, and this was a long time coming and this were many, we, we had been having many conversations for many years about this issue and wrestling with it ourselves. But as we made meaningful connections with people here, like I'll just give Stevie and Cassie as an example, like not just working together, but being friends and, and, and loving them and understanding how they love each other and how, and, and yeah, m- many other couples. And I just, I just could not, I couldn't sit in the seat knowing that they couldn't, you know, that they couldn't get married there. I I just felt like it was a betrayal of my friends um, and then of what what I believed, you know. So that was in, and so then I didn't go back. And well, and, and I'll add to to this, um, especially in a place like Los Angeles. I mean, it might if you're you know, there's plenty of there's plenty of evangelical churches, um, where it's you would know just unequivocally, like okay, this is not a, necessarily a gay friendly place. Um, even though they may be loving and say something like love the, you know. Love the sinner, hate the sin, the, the old cliche. But especially in LA. And, I, and in LA they wouldn't say they that. They would never say that. But, but that's the belief. Well, I, I, what I'm getting at is in LA, they're, the churches and the people leading the churches are smart enough to know that they cannot have an outwardly anti-LGBTQ stance because they wouldn't have anybody show up. Um, and there's plenty of LGBTQ people who go to these places on a regular basis and they don't even know that if you dig deep enough, if you put the pastor in a corner, if you backed him or her into a corner and said, do you believe that marriage is only between a man and a woman? They would say yes because they they have a, a particular interpretation of the Bible that leads them to that conclusion. Now there's plenty of churches that would say no, we're pro LGBTQ. So, but I'm just saying that that is a thing that you kind of run into in LA is like all the outward signs are that this is a super loving and accepting place and it is a loving place. And we're not talking about a bunch of bigoted people, but when it gets down to it, the theology sort of leads them to a place that they're not completely accepting and affirming. Uh, and that's kind of the situation that you found yourself in. Yeah, and it and I th- I think that Oh, well, I know that also resonated with my family and was a, a a major contributor to to saying, you know what? Let's just let's just ease out. Let's let's ease out of this, or let's well let's step out. 
Mm-hmm. And that's what we did, and we lived happily ever after. No, um, I mean, I guess some people are thinking, could we have found a more liberal, LGBTQ affirming church? Yes. Um, you know, I think you looked around, and it was just there is a church that if when I go to church, I go to I I go to this church. That is, yeah, is a, is an affirming church. But you don't really go. But I don't really go. I go. And, I, and I, I, I'll go. I'll go sometimes. I think for, for like me, I didn't Christmas. I was like, I'm just not ready to go to to church in general, and I may never be. Uh, I'm just not ready to enter back into a specific system of belief, even if it's different and it aligns with, like. The, the the practical applications of that belief system are exactly in line with how I want to live my life. I just like I'm I'm st- maybe I'm still just too close in or have been in it so long that I just I feel like I need more distance from it. I just can't. I, did, I did, and, and it there's a lot of like at least all the places that are that meet that check those boxes they're like very um What's the word ecumenical? Right, and it's like okay, that's like a high church thing, and it's like I don't, I don't think I would thrive well I, under I, that system because yeah, ironically, as much as I yeah. love systems, I do think that as I'm beginning to learn about myself, and as I read those journal entries to you, and like my my internal dialogue, I think you're seeing as I am appreciating that like I, I put a lot of pressure on myself, and I I. I didn't. I don't interact he- in a healthy way at this point in my life with um, a robust belief system. Yeah. So, I mean, y- you ended up saying that y- you applied the label of like hopeful agnostic to to where you were right now. And I mean, if I were to put, if I were to label myself, um, I think I would say. I'm an agnostic who wants to be hopeful. I think um, I have made a decision to be open. Uh, I do want that. I don't want to be, I just, you know, I don't wanna be an atheist. Uh, so I'm I'm hopeful that I can be hopeful. Uh, but it, I, I I know that it kind of. Why don't you want to be an atheist? Because I'm not. I'm not convinced that God doesn't exist, and I don't want to. You know, I. If God does exist, I want to be open to that connection. You know, I. I, You know, I'm. That's just not. It's not how I think. Like to come down hard on something, and like. But I think that. Left to my own devices. From a practical standpoint, I would end up in as like a practical atheist, where it's like, you know what? I do feel like it's easiest for me to believe that when you die, it's just like Dana Carvey, my <laughs> my Wayne's World doppelganger. I, I'm replacing the Bible with Garth and Bonnie Raitt. It seems right. I, was, I remember years ago when I was listening to the WTF podcast, Dana Carvey was talking about how, how he believed that like. When you die, it's it's just like the experience you had before you were born. You remember that? So I'm like, yeah, that's oh, that that's actually comforting, and I actually I find it easy to believe that for some reason. It's not, you know, I'm not compelled to believe it, but it's just an easy place for my mind to rest. Well, and you don't have to believe it. I think the re- the reason I'm not an atheist is because um, it just feels too definitive. It's it right. Agnostic is the label that literally means you don't know and. I hope I'm always when it comes to these issues I hope I I'm always I don't want I just don't but yeah, I, d- I don't want to become dogmatic about anything. Yeah, but I don't want to com- become complacent either because I do think that it's it's easiest for me to believe that everybody believes whatever they want to believe like your innermost desires maybe that's I mean, it could be something primal like survival and security and uh, it could I mean there's so many different things but like we have a way of finding what works for us. And I think that's instinctive. So just to put it bluntly, you believe what you wanna believe. You know, it's like, I find it easy to believe that. I find it easy to believe that because so many people have had so many 
earth shattering experiences that are in complete contradiction that it's like, that probably means that God's not personal. <laughs> you know, it's like, it makes or more Or maybe sense. God is personal and that God is just great at relating very specifically to a lot of different people in a very personal way that makes sense to them. And you know I what? don't know. But you know what, I'm open to that. That would be a very loving. Isn't God capable of doing that? Again, we're, I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and try yeah. to invent a new belief system yeah. of like this is what I believe specifically. I I just want to do the work to stay open, um, but not to get like you said dogmatic. And I know that that takes work. It's get, it takes an investment of time and priority for me to not just sit back and just kind of be, just go with the flow of like. I'm not looking, again, it's not looking for the next thing to latch onto and believe and start to follow, but it's being open to what, how God may exist and may want to connect with me. Um, I, I think the main thing is I don't want to judge. I don't want to condemn. I wanna be as loving as I can. Maybe that sounds trite, I, it does, but so what? I wanna be as loving as I can. And it, you know, I, I do feel like over the past few years, my capacity to love has grown. My capacity to love myself and others has expanded a lot more in, in the last few years. And I, I take that as a good sign. I don't, I just don't think that God if God exists or ha however God exists, I just can't believe that and I that me being open and sincere and as loving as possible and as honest as possible is disqualifying me from receiving God's love. I just, I can't accept that. Oh, and so I have hope that that's true because I can't, I cannot just decide to be or believe something that I don't. Um, and I'm, I'm just. That's, I'm, not, that's not gonna stop a lot of people on the internet from trying to convince you though. Yeah, and I, I, I feel like because a lot, of, I feel like a lot of what I said could be boiled down to some neurosis. <laughs> you know, it's like, but it, but the intellectual path. I mean, it's the two things. I think the one made me receptive to the to the other, and I just think it's got to be so. And and that's truth. Um, I I just don't know how people will respond to what I just said though, when I'm like, I wanna be open, I don't know, I'm an agnostic, I just want to focus on love, and then I'm like, but the reason I got here is because of what I was convinced that was no longer true. Well, I can tell you how I would have reacted to it when I was a Christian, and I would have been sad for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's gonna be a lot of people who are sad for us, and there's I, a lot of people who are gonna feel sorry for us, and they're gonna be like, I just, I can't, you know, I asked a close friend, I was like, so do you think I'm going to hell? And he was like, I don't, no I don't. I think, um, I think what you had was real and it still is. And you're at this, and you're, you're, you're in a process. I don't, I, he, I, he didn't say I think you'll come back. I think maybe it's forward and on the other side and, but it's like, I appreciated that in one sense. I guess in the in the other sense, it's like I I don't feel like I'm going to go back in a cent to any of the like the like the specific yeah. beliefs about the Bible. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's where I'm at, and that's the conclusion of my story to this point. But it's obviously not the conclusion of my journey. Um, and I'm immediately thinking about how people are responding to it, and I'm just trying not to do that. Yeah, well. But I, I, I want to be a conversation to happen. Yeah, well, maybe we can help 
listen, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to dictate how the conversation should go from here, but let me just say just a couple of thoughts that I have about the conversation that will happen as a result of these stories kind of going out to the public. Most people, and I totally get why this is the case, are going to interact with our stories in whatever way makes sense according to their predetermined worldview. Right. So if you're a Christian and you're not a Christian that has had a lot of doubts or you're just like 100% sure that you're right, uh, you're most likely, you're gonna filter us through your theology, just like I was talking about at the beginning of my story. So you may conclude that, well, you guys were definitely never actual Christians. It was an intellectual thing that that's specifically addressed in the Bible and you know, God's gonna say he never knew you. And if that makes you, you know, I, I understand why you have to believe that. I don't accept that, but I can't make you change your mind. Uh, and then there's a lot of other situations that people may find that, but you're gonna make it consistent with your predetermined belief. The only thing I ask about and, and I hope that this was clear and Link made it, I try to make it clear and Link try to make it clear that we are just kind of telling our story, trying to be as honest as possible about what transpired in our lives that kind of led us to this point. And I would love if the conversation would be, tell us your story, right? Or, it, it, you know, you don't have to, like I said, I know people are gonna send a lot of arguments, probably especially to me because I'm the one that talked about all the you know the specific ar arguments about evolution or uh, Old Testament archaeology and that kind of thing. So people are going to try to send resources and books. Have you have you heard of this? Have you read this article? And I'm not saying don't do that. Some people won't be able to help yourself cuz I wouldn't have been able to help myself if I was in your shoes, you know. But I would just hope that you would just actually try to consider our stories from the point of hey, we're just humans trying to be honest, we're your online friends <laughs> trying to be honest uh, and just consider just consider the story on its face. Don't just immediately. Try to fix us. Try to fix us or try to make it fit into your system because I think that that's, I think that the world has got so much polarization right now. People are like, I'm right, you're wrong, that's it and more than ever, and it's interesting. We've, we're so we're much be, so we're so much better connected to one another than we've ever been, but we're also so divided. Um, and it's this just horrible irony that's kind of the nature of the information age. And I I just don't want that kind of conversation to happen in our community where people are throwing rocks at each other and you know mm -hmm. insulting one another and calling you know. Listen, there's gonna be people from both ends of the spectrum who are gonna get engaged in this conversation. Please see people's humanity, see our humanity, and don't just resort to just putting your feet in into your trench and just holding your position. Consider somebody consider somebody's viewpoint, you know? I also wonder if people's takeaway is, you know, like Dang, Link, if it wasn't for Rhett, you might you might be in a better place. You know, it's like, <laughs> man, he really brought you down. You know, uh, it's absolutely true that, you know, and that I wouldn't I wouldn't have been grappling with these issues. I, I don't. I I, can, I, pro I probably wouldn't have been grappling with issues. I probably wouldn't have done it. You know, because as 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 a hard time as I was having, I still didn't want. It, you know, it was still ultimately this so very safe for me, and I and I really need that. Um, but I'm very grateful that 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 your personality is different than mine in that way. That it was my active choice at every turn to actively engage in the discussion, and I didn't. You know, we shared so so much of our lives and our spiritual journey was so similar that we we had the exact same language and so many of the same experiences. We went on all the same church trips and we were party to all the same prayer groups and you know. So whenever I really benefited and kind of I hacked the system in a lot of ways, I feel like yes, I trusted you, but it was almost like trusting 
your response to it was very trustworthy as my own response because our our journeys were so in lockstep. And then I, but I, there was pivotal points all along the way when I would have to pick up those books and read them. It wasn't just the Francis Collins one because it started to get real and it was like, I gotta read this stuff for myself. Um, I, I'll, that'll transition to my, well, I'll, I'll let you respond to that because I think that people might say it's your fault. Um, It is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no, I, I'm very conscious of that. I, I, I think that, um, I mean, interestingly, the the other way around. I mean, like in any sort, in any testimony that you give, uh, that you hear somebody give in the church, it usually comes down to a person who shared the gospel with them, right? Like it's people share the message, um, and for better or worse, it also works the other way. It's like I'm a key figure in your anti testimony. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just a, it, it's a fact. It's um, anti testimony, and, and and I think that. Um. Yeah, people will be upset about that. People will be mad at me. I, I don't I, doubt that. But I, I, I'm letting you off the hook because, again, I'm 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 grateful for it and I'm fully responsible for it. Did it make the conversations that I had with Christy even more difficult? Yes, because it was I was presenting these beliefs that were a threat to her. They were genuine questions to me, but they were also tied to you, like uh, whispering it in my ear. You know. Um, and so we had to, you know, we had to work through that as well. It's like, well, is is this is this something that you're grappling with, or something that Rhett is grappling with? You know, um, ultimately, it's something that I I'm grateful that legitimate questions are things that I actually wrestled with. I think I need, and that goes back to my intention of working to be hopeful because. I feel like it does t it does take work for me to engage in those questions, the difficult questions, in order to become more of who I actually want to be. Yeah, it, that's not all, an easy thing. All to the do. all the decisions were yours. I, the, Absolutely. All, all I did was just present information as I was processing it. I, and, and at no point was I trying to convince you of anything. And at no point was I trying to like. I was the only person hey, you I, could talk to who would just. Like, I was. You could I was just talk fighting. Really in you. talk. Yeah. yeah. I was confiding in you. But, and I think that I did not want to, in my session here, I didn't wanna retread the reasons that you gave, the arguments that were compelling for you. That was because you you gave some of those and you gave resources. But I also didn't wanna do it because I didn't want to, I didn't wanna share a story that was, you know, when whenever my belief started to pivot, I described those in like a timeline fashion, but I intentionally didn't describe, well, what is it that made you believe that Jesus didn't raise from the dead? What is it that made you believe that you couldn't, that you that you saw Paul differently or, you know, uh, all of the arguments, I didn't make them because I feel like as a listener, it's up to them it's up to you to to look into that if you want to. But I've also I also feel like I was giving you an out if like, hey, this is working for me like our friend said. That was like if if you if this is working for you, then um you know, I don't want to be the one to screw it screw it up for you <laughs> like Red did for me. <laughs> 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 but um I do invite you and I I'll make a wreck. But you know, I found this book called Why I Believed, Reflections of a Former Missionary written by Kenneth W. Daniels. I feel like I'm on Reading Rainbow now. I mean, this is a freaking self-published book. Ken published a book. It's very highly rated, but it's very specific. It, it, was, it was perfect for me because it was, um, Ken was like a Bible translator who like raised finances just like we did. And but he's such a thorough thinker. He's like, he's kind of like the two of us combined because yeah, this is the guy that I want to be. He talked in terms he, of he, how well he he researched. All he this talked stuff. in equal parts about his own experience of deconstruction, um, and like 
he's quoting his own journal entries in here. So you really understand what's going on his, in his heart as well as his mind. Um, and so if, if you relate to the specifics of coming out of evangelicalism, especially if you like, if you were in the ministry or if you are in the ministry, um, and you you want to have a more, you want to read something that has a more personal touch than that. Th- this is a, this is a profound book for me. So Ken, thank you for publishing this book. Um, but again, if you don't want to get into it, don't 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 read it. Don't read it just so you can dismiss it. Don't read anything just to dismiss it. Just don't even read it if that's what you're going to do. Um, but again, you gave resources last time and that's another one to add to the list well, this time. And you know, I appreciate your story because I, I mean, my guess is that more people relate to your story than mine. I, 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 that, I just, that's my, in my experience when I talk about the things that happen with me, again, like I said, a lot of people just are like, you're you're crazy. Like why, why do you think about these things? You, or, or at least, well, he lost me. Yeah, and so it's like that meant a lot to him, but like I don't think it matters that much, really. And I think yours was very personal, and it was about what you were kind of experiencing on a practical level, which I, I think m- m- more people will relate to. I would just say again, as we, you know, begin to have a conversation, listen, we, the next podcast is not. We don't know what it's going to be about, but it, it, we're going to take a break from this subject yeah. matter. Uh, but like I, I think that. This stuff, this spiritual stuff, um, is going is now a part of ear biscuits. You know, it's it mm-hmm. it, w- it will be something that we talk about, whether we talk about you know our our past. I mean, we we want to answer more questions. I know that there's lots of questions that people have related to these stories. I can only imagine. So ask those questions. We'll try to be as clarifying as we can and. Uh, if you make yeah. us think about something in a different way, we'll we'll let you know. I mean, we, we want this to be a process. We want this to be a conversation. Uh, but we're going to let those questions be generated, and uh, and then we'll continue that conversation at another time. Yeah. So hashtag your biscuits, and also again, I'll encourage you to share these episodes with people that uh, you know it would it would resonate with or um, spark more conversations between you and your friends. So. Share it. Um, we'll speak at you next week, probably about something else. About and something then, else. And then we'll we'll see if we most likely will come back to it. Thank you. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.